When Samantha Wolford called her mother, she was hysterical. Masked men had broken into her house in Titus County, Texas, leaving her bound and gagged in her bedroom. That wasn't all, though, because they had abducted her husband and father to three of her children, Ernie, and she had no idea where they took him. This is Monsters. Samantha Wolford was born on August 28, 1989 in Mount Pleasant, Texas, the oldest of three siblings. She had not been lucky in love. When she was 19 years old, she discovered that she was pregnant with twins. Her high school boyfriend, who was the baby's father, didn't want any part in raising them. He broke up with Samantha, leaving her to raise two infants alone. It wasn't until Samantha met Ernie that it seemed as if her luck was about to change. Ernest Ibarra, who went by Ernie, was born on December 25, 1985, also in Mount Pleasant. After they met at a local tattoo parlor, they quickly started a relationship. Ernie didn't mind that Samantha had two young children. In fact, it was quite the opposite. He wanted to build a family with her, and in 2011, Samantha became pregnant again. To her and Ernie's delight, it was another set of twins. Despite Samantha claiming that she could only get pregnant with twins, two years later she gave birth to their third child together. By now, Samantha was a 24-year-old woman with five young children. She and Ernie couldn't afford to put their children in preschool, so Samantha had no choice but to quit her job and spend her days at home looking after the kids. Ernie became the family's sole breadwinner, and he found that his two jobs weren't enough, so he started searching for a third job. Ernie was taking on as many extra shifts as he could get, and when he got home, he was exhausted. Samantha was worn out from being isolated at home with the kids, and despite Ernie's hard work, before long, Ernie and Samantha's relationship began to suffer. Samantha felt that her husband wasn't giving her the same amount of attention and affection that he always had, and she became more and more dissatisfied with her life. Additionally, Samantha felt like she was completely unable to help bring in any income to support her family. She began to research things that she could do from home to earn a little extra cash, and before long, she had a plan. She was going to become a YouTuber. I'm obsessive. I have to look good when I go to sleep. I wash my face and I smear eyeliner across my face. I will not be able to sleep unless I wash that completely off. I worried about that every single day that we were together. I was freaking out thinking that... Uh, something bad was going to happen. That's a rough life to lead, dating somebody or being married to somebody that's um, going overseas. That's hard. Right now is not a good time for me to be pregnant. Not to mention I was taking birth control. So I didn't think it could be positive. But it freaked me out nonetheless. And I had a few people look at it and they couldn't tell either if it was positive or negative. So I bought some of those clear blue pregnancy tests that say pregnant or not pregnant so you can tell for sure and that's a little yeah no I'm not exactly excited about this Samantha's YouTube channel told a story that many of her viewers found relatable and interesting a young mother being open and honest about how hard it was to raise five children she used her videos as a kind of diary, talking about her personal life and her hopes and dreams. The work she was putting into the videos began to pay off, and the subscriber count began to climb. Since Samantha was little, she wanted to be famous. Now, that dream was coming true. Despite Samantha's success on YouTube, her relationship with her husband didn't improve. If anything, it worsened. Samantha was pouring more time and energy into her online personality, which resulted in her beginning to neglect her children. Ernie would come home after working double shifts and find that the kids were hungry or needed to be bathed. Samantha and Ernie fought often, and Samantha also complained about their relationship to her close friends and family. She had told one of her aunts, Ginger Kesterson, that she felt sick of Ernie. 
When talking to one of her closest childhood friends, Stephen Patterson, she confessed that Ernie had been physically abusing her. At one point, Samantha asked Stephen to take care of it, which he assumed meant she wanted him to intimidate or fight Ernie. Early in the morning of February 20th, 2015, Samantha called her mother, Rosie. When Rosie answered the phone, Samantha began sobbing, telling her that an unknown person had broken into the family's home and tied her up before kidnapping Ernie. Instead of calling the police, Rosie called her sister Ginger before getting in her car and driving to Samantha's house. Ginger's boyfriend Brett was the one who answered the phone. Rosie didn't give him many details, just telling him that they needed to go to Samantha's house because something was happening. Ginger was the first person who arrived at Samantha's house where she noticed that Samantha's car was missing from the driveway. The scene was just like Samantha had described. She was upstairs with her feet tied together and her hands bound behind her back. It seemed as if someone had tried to gag her, but she had managed to free herself enough to make a phone call. Before untying Samantha, Ginger went through the house to check on her nieces and nephews. She was relieved to find that they were still fast asleep, but she found it unusual that they were all sleeping in one room together instead of different rooms like they usually did. Once she knew that the children were safe, Ginger began untying Samantha. It was difficult because the ropes were tightly knotted. Ginger asked Samantha how she had managed to make the phone call to Rosie. Samantha responded that she hadn't been able to free her hands or feet, so she had managed to dial the number using her face. Then Ginger asked where Samantha's car was, and her niece responded that she didn't have it at the moment. While all that was going on, Ginger was on the phone with 911. Cause County 911, what's your emergency? I have a home invasion. My niece is tied up. I I am... I am at the verge of untying my niece at this particular moment. Okay, she's tied up. She is tied up and gagged. And gagged? Is that what yes, you're Is there anybody else there? Where are the kids? The ki we have five small infants asleep. Five small infants asleep? Yes, ranging from seven to one. Seven to one years old? Yes, ma'am. Does she know? Um, yeah, where's Did you know who the suspects are? Can I talk to her? Is she able to speak? Yes, ma'am. Hello. Hi, Samantha. I know you're upset, but I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Do you need EMS? No, they didn't do anything to be baby wife. She's advising no. They only hit her once. Okay. They just asked my aunt if it was bruising or anything, and she said no. They hit me in the face. Okay. Um, they hit you in the face? Yeah, um, they had me tied up and they dragged me down the stairs to face my husband. And when my husband went in and faced me, they hit me in the face. Like, backhand slapped me. And so he looked at me then and they said, I thought that would get your attention. And I want you to stare at this woman. Do you want us to kill her? And he said, no. And they said, then tell us the truth. And he said, I don't know anything. Deputy Chris Durant for the Titus County Sheriff's Office was the one who responded to the call. During their initial search of the house, investigators noticed something strange. Despite Samantha and Ernie being two able-bodied young adults, there was absolutely no sign of a struggle. Nothing was broken and no furniture was out of place, except for the front door which had been broken. None of the family's valuables were missing. In fact, there was no sign that the perpetrator had searched for them at all. They had simply tied up Samantha, taken Ernie, and left. Shortly after the police arrived on the scene, they began questioning Samantha, hoping to find out more details about what seemed to be a very unusual kidnapping. Samantha provided them with a more detailed timeline of the events that had taken place that night. She said that she and Ernie had been sleeping in their bed when they had woken up to multiple unknown attackers standing above them. They had been wearing dark, loose clothing, as well as masks that hid all of their facial features. There was nothing she could remember that would help to identify them. One person had been holding a knife to Samantha's neck, forcing her to remain still, while the other person forcibly dragged Ernie downstairs. Samantha said she was also taken downstairs and yelled at by the attackers before being taken back upstairs. She said she could hear her husband being beaten downstairs, and then after a while, she heard Ernie being taken out the front door. Once Ernie was out of the bedroom, the second assailant had tied Samantha's hands and feet and placed a gag in her mouth. 
During that initial interview, investigators had one key question for Samantha. She had been bound and gagged, not knowing whether or not the attackers had harmed her children. So why had she called her mother instead of phoning the police? She explained that she was still tied up, so she had to use her face to use the phone, and she was able to call the last person in her call history. During her interview, Samantha had revealed that she remembered the perpetrators had taken Ernie's phone. There was no sign of Ernie in the house, and the police hoped that they would be able to track his phone. Deputy Chris Bragg sent Ernie's cell phone number through to his communications officer and discovered that the phone had pinged in nearby Pittsburgh, Texas just past 3 a.m. However, there were no other clues as to Ernie's location, and shortly afterwards, they lost the signal. With very few leads to go on, investigators decided to interview Samantha a second time. By that time, it was past 9 a.m., Samantha seemed to have a change of heart and began hinting that she might know who the perpetrators were. She asked the sheriff if she would be considered an accomplice in the kidnapping for not revealing the identities of her husband's abductors before finally giving the investigators some names. The first was a man she only knew as Johnny Rebel. The second, she said, was his brother-in-law named Jose, who went by Jojo, and the third, she said, was a black male named Tay Rhymes. Samantha explained that she had only met John a few days earlier because she was friends with John's girlfriend, Sharla. Sharla had been admitted to the hospital for a C-section and Samantha had gone to visit her. During that time, she'd let John drive her car to pick up her children from her aunt's house and also allowed him to borrow the vehicle when he needed to run errands. According to Samantha, she had opened up to John about her marriage, telling him that Ernie was abusive. She complained that Ernie was constantly calling her on the phone and that she felt like she couldn't escape from him. Then, John became enraged and told her that he and his brother would kidnap Ernie to teach him a lesson. Now, Ernie had served time prior to meeting Samantha for assault on an officer and he had been arrested after a domestic disturbance with Samantha a year prior to this. But it's generally believed that most of Samantha's stories of abuse at the hands of Ernie were greatly embellished. The domestic disturbance stemmed from Ernie slapping a phone out of Samantha's hands and it ended up hitting one of the children. So the injury in that case wasn't even to her. It makes it hard to determine how serious the abuse from Ernie was when, during her police interview, she's trying to minimize it in order to look like she doesn't have a reason to want him harmed. So I'm guessing y'all had made up with him and got him back together. Mm -hmm. How long after that assault happened did y'all get back together? Oh, a few weeks after the emergency protective order actually was lifted. In the meantime, um, he found out from some, some judge that he could call me. So he had started calling me, which I told you that. Yes, he can continue calling me, asking what my demands were, what I had to do to even remotely have me consider him being back in the house with us. I just want me to take anger management and get help. He went through all of the anger management courses. He completed those on a certificate to send them to the judge. Uh, off and on, we Skyped and things seemed better. And so the first time I actually got to see him, I, it was kind of a sporadic thing. I would let him come out maybe spend the night, try to get him in a few days and just so for the first few, two weeks or something, I just kind of wanted to feel out how he was acting, and sure. then he came home. A quick search on Facebook led the investigators to Jose Ponce, Jonathan Sanford, and Octavius Rhymes. A background check revealed that John had an extensive criminal record, so investigators decided to track him down immediately. John's girlfriend, Sharla, was still in the hospital and John was still in the maternity ward with her, and luckily for the authorities, Jose was there as well. Police arrived at the maternity ward to place John and Jose under arrest and they went with them willingly without causing any trouble. Once he was in police custody, Jose sang like a canary. The first thing that Jose told the detective dropped a bomb on the entire investigation. Samantha is the ringleader. Samantha is the one, and I can prove this. If you don't believe me, as God is my witness, 
All you have to do, you you can take you and, and 15 of the officers. I don't care. Take me in front of my wife. And my wife will tell you a piece of what she overheard. Well, now, I've actually kind of heard. And my wife will tell you, she's the one who orchestrated it. He went on to tell the detective that he was asked by John to help him with a job. According to Jose, he didn't know exactly what was going to happen and he was just going to be a lookout. Sure. When John was interviewed, he was also surprisingly open about his involvement, willingly confirming that he had been the one to kidnap Ernie. His explanation of his motive was the same as what Samantha had told police. After finding out that Ernie was abusive, he'd wanted to help Samantha out, and he had come up with the plan to scare Ernie into leaving her alone. He said his intention was to teach him a lesson about abusing women. According to John, he also was only going to be the lookout. Supposedly, from what I understood, supposedly we were going out here, all I was supposed to do was pull up, sit outside, they were going to go in, supposedly rough the dude up, Mm -hmm. This is what I was being told, but at the same time, I keep getting, and don't forget, you got, you got a newborn baby you're looking after, blah, 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 this and that, right? John expanded on his story. He said that once they got to the house, the other guys made him go into the house and participate in the abduction. It was at that point in the interview that he told the detective that he didn't think Samantha was involved in the crime. Of course, by then, authorities already knew that Samantha was involved. It's also crazy that John is still protecting Samantha, despite knowing that she had named him as the person responsible for the abduction. After they removed Ernie from the house, they'd forced him into an isolated patch of woods. According to John, he had been planning to release Ernie there, but Jose had other ideas. Well, before I got any further, the other dude pops out and starts coming with me on my website. He's like, man in the vehicle too. Before I make the vehicle, all I hear is pop. I Who's got the gun? Jojo does. Okay, then what happened? I know that sound by heart. I can work with guns. My dad's 21 years Navy. I know where the gun sounds like. We're in the vehicle. I started and Jojo comes out. He's got the blanket, the bandana that was wrapped around the dude's face, the other cloth material, a bell, he's got all this shit. He puts it in the back seat, he gets in, he's like, let's go. Jose had brought a gun with him, which he used to shoot Ernie in the head. It was a fatal wound, and Ernie died instantly. The investigators asked John to lead them to Ernie's body, and just like every other step of the investigation, John cooperated. He took them to a densely wooded area where they found Ernie's body. He had a single gunshot wound where he'd been shot in the head at close range. Next, John agreed to take the police to Octavius' house where they were keeping the murder weapon. It wasn't initially found where John said it would be, but after a short search of the property, it was found in the crawl space under the house, right inside a vent in the foundation. Authorities had trouble locating Octavius at first, but he was eventually arrested and charged with the crime. When he was brought in for an interview, he refused to speak to the detectives. During an examination of Octavius' cell phone records, there were several messages from Samantha where she had urged the men to make sure they turned Ernie's cell phone off. Samantha had deleted the message that read, quote, Kill his phone. Shut that shit down. But Octavius had never deleted it from his phone. She'd also sent a follow-up message 40 minutes later that read, quote, Ditch phone. Move. When the investigators brought up the messages to John, he admitted that he had lied about planning the kidnapping on his own. He'd actually planned the entire crime together with Samantha. When Samantha had complained to John about Ernie being controlling and abusive, John had casually mentioned that, if she wanted, he would be able to take him out of the picture. Samantha had asked how he would do that, and that's when the two started coming up with the plan. Initially, they hadn't planned on killing Ernie. They wanted to ruin his life by planting drugs in his car and framing him for methamphetamine charges. Samantha had agreed that the men could borrow her car to carry out the scheme. You know, because why wouldn't you want them to use your car to commit a crime you supposedly knew nothing about? 
On February 19th, the day before Ernie was killed, Samantha had been at the hospital visiting John's girlfriend, Sharla. John, Octavius, and Jose had also been there at the time. Samantha didn't have anyone to watch her children, so the three men agreed to take the kids on a trip to Walmart, giving Samantha time to catch up with Sharla. After they left Walmart, John went back to the hospital to pick up Samantha and they all ended up at Octavius's house. That evening, Samantha, John, and Octavius drove to Mount Vernon in Samantha's car so they could pick up a large amount of meth from Octavius's cousin. The purchase had been successful, and at around 7 p.m. that evening, the group had driven back to Octavius's house. Jose's girlfriend was at the house cooking enchiladas, and she remembered noticing that the group seemed very secretive. At several points, Samantha and the three men would go into another room so that they could have a conversation in private. Jose's girlfriend could hear them whispering, but she couldn't make out much of what they were saying. She heard Jose ask Samantha something about her kids, to which Samantha responded that, quote, she could give them something to put them to sleep fast. She also heard Samantha say that, quote, she wanted something done and that she was going to get it done regardless. Later that night, the men decided against the plan to frame Ernie because they were nervous about involving the police in the scheme, probably the only smart decision they made about the plan. All three of them already had criminal records, so they knew the consequences would be harsh if they got caught. They weren't confident that they could pull it off, and they also wanted to smoke the meth themselves instead of wasting it on framing Ernie. The group began to joke about how it would be easier to just kill Ernie, but after a while, they began to seriously consider it as an option. At one point, John asked Samantha, quote, What do you think about him dying? Samantha asked if he was serious, to which John replied that he was. He told Samantha that, if she wanted Ernie dead, all she had to do was leave the front door of her house unlocked that night. At midnight, John and Octavius dropped Samantha and her kids back home. As they'd agreed, John and Octavius began to prepare Samantha's car for the crime by taking the children's booster seats out of the back. They drove to a nearby Walmart where they stole three pairs of disposable gloves before picking up Jose. Then, the three men smoked the meth they'd bought that day and drove back to Samantha's house. As promised, she'd left the front door unlocked, so it was easy for them to make their way inside. All three men climbed the stairs to Samantha and Ernie's bedroom. While Octavius got Samantha out of the bed and took her downstairs, John and Jose forced Ernie to his feet and began to beat him, even pistol-whipping him on several occasions. Wanting to make sure that their cover story was intact in case Ernie escaped, John told Ernie that they were going to kidnap him because his father owed him money. Once Ernie had been subdued, they dragged him downstairs where Samantha and Octavius were waiting. Then, Octavius took Samantha back upstairs, where he staged the scene by tying her hands and feet together. He told her that the three of them would handle the rest of the crime and asked her to wait there until John contacted her. The three men bound Ernie's hands using tape and took him outside. As they left, they kicked the door in, hoping that it would make the crime look like an authentic break-in. Octavius grabbed a small log from the yard, which he used to hit Ernie in the back, before they ordered him to climb into the back of Samantha's car. The group drove to Sand Crossing, an isolated area in Camp County, Texas. John led Ernie through a game trail in the forest, while Jose and Octavius walked behind with their weapons. They only made it about 150 feet into the woods before Ernie stumbled and fell, landing face down on the forest floor. While he was trying to get back up, Jose took the opportunity to shoot him in the back of the head. Later, the doctor who performed the autopsy on Ernie testified that there was evidence that the gun's muzzle had been pressed to his skin when the shot was fired. After confirming that the shot had been fatal, the three men had driven back to Octavius's house, stripped off their clothes, and burned them to dispose of DNA evidence. Less than a day later, all three perpetrators had been arrested. And finally, investigators had all the missing details of the story. The events of the past 24 hours made sense. Octavius Rimes went to trial in December of 2016, where he argued that he had been unaware of the plan to kill Ernie, saying that he had only ever been aware that the group had planned to kidnap him. He was sentenced to 75 years in prison, after a jury found him guilty of all of the charges against him. 
Both John and Jose decided to plead guilty to Ernie's kidnapping and murder, receiving a 50-year sentence each. Samantha's trial took place in September of 2017. The prosecution argued that, although Samantha hadn't been the one to pull the trigger, she had gone along with the plan that she knew ended with Ernie's death. She had spent most of the previous day with John, Octavius, and Jose going over their plan. She had agreed to leave the front door unlocked for the men and had promised to make sure that her children were asleep so they wouldn't interfere with the crime. She had even agreed to lend John her car for the abduction. When the verdict came in, Samantha Wolford was found guilty and sentenced to 99 years for murder, as well as 50 years for kidnapping. She might not have kidnapped and killed him herself, but the jury found that she had done everything in her power to assist his abductors and make sure that Ernie Ibarra died that night. Only something that a monster would do to the father of her children. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.